Grant us, O Lord, to trust with you all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who boast, who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, you are an everlasting God who is always there with us. Today in Luke, Lord, we learn about how you are asking us to go all in into your everlastingness. Help us, Lord, to surrender our lives to you every single moment to allow you to be the everlasting presence in our life. Amen. Amen. It's the gospel of our Lord Jesus according to Luke. Praise you, Lord Christ. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and he asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. It's the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, help us to wrestle with the challenging words at times of your scripture to pull and tug at our heart so that we ultimately come into a more intimate relationship with you. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. All right. So, it's a fun piece of scripture for a family service, huh? (laughs) So we're supposed to uh, hate father and mother. Okay. Okay children and friends and even ourselves. That's awesome. Okay. Um, and, and, and one thing to keep in mind before, you know, we jump into this is, um, you know, we come from a, from a tradition and a culture. Uh, since we, we are Jesus people, we come from a Jewish tradition and a Jewish culture. Jesus was a Jew, obviously. And, and that, that culture just loved to wrestle with Scripture, and, and, and they were okay with being challenged by Scripture and sort of getting in the ring with Scripture, getting in the ring with what God is saying. All you have to do is read the Psalms, and in the Psalms you hear in Lamentations, those first hundred Psalms of just people saying, why, God, why are you doing this? Where are you, God? Why are you punishing me? But at the end of the Psalm, they always get to a place of, but I will trust. I will trust in you even though I do not understand you. So to hear a piece of scripture like this, if we put it in the context of first century Palestine, it is alarming, it is striking, but that's expected. Because don't forget, Jesus, to many, was a prophet. So if you're Jewish, on a scale of like, he's absolutely crazy and insane, or he's the Messiah, there's places where, yeah, but in the middle, he, he, he's a prophet. And we have, the, the Islam sees Jesus as a prophet, you have all these prophets, then you have Jesus, and then there's Muhammad to, to the Islamic religion. So Jesus is seen by all Abrahamic religions as a prophet. And what do prophets do? They provoke, they alarm, they excite, they rivet us, they challenge us, they awaken us. And they're going to do it with their words. They're going to speak hard truth, and they're going to smack us in the face and say, wake up! Are we really listening to God? Are we really following God? Are you really in an intimate relationship with our Lord, our Father? And a passage like this today would make complete sense for a prophet to deliver a message like this. It would be alarming, but it would get people to be like, 
You, you asking me to hate my mother and my father? Okay, all right, what is this all about? Talk to me more, Rabbi. Tell me, what are you, what are you really saying here? The prophet does not want our vote. <laughs> the prophet just wants to speak the truth. And the prophet will speak in hyperbole if needed. As we know, Jesus says, you know, if, you're, if you can't trust your hand, cut it off. If your eye's looking at something, you know, that's not supposed to be right, tear it out. Is that literal? I hope not, or we're just all going to be missing limbs and stuff all over the place. But like this today, is Jesus really saying to hate, to hate parents, hate children, hate self? Let's look at the language. Our language study, if we look at this, is that the Greek doesn't really help us too much. The Greek on to hate is to abhor. So it's almost like hate. So if we look at the Greek, we're like, oh, Jesus really is saying hate. But if we look at the culture that surrounds it, Jesus obviously was not speaking Greek. Jesus was speaking... Amen. There we go. So more of a Semitic culture, according, I'm, I'm no scholar here, but like Frank B. Craddock and N.T. Wright all come to the conclusion that it's more to turn away. Jesus is asking them to turn away, to detach oneself. That's how a first century Jew would have heard this. Jesus is saying, turn away. Turn away. Are you willing to be prepared to turn away from mother, turn away from father, to detach yourself from mother, from father, from child? Or are you completely glued and married and can't let go no matter what? <laughs> Thank you, Margie. Appreciate it. <laughs> but that's still biting. Turn away from loved ones. Now, um, children, you don't get off the hook here by this idea of you get to hate your parents because just, just remember that in, in a lot of scripture, we have scripture, children, that says, you know, honor your mother and your father, honor your parents in ex Exodus 20. We have Colossians 3, which talks about, is it Colossians? Yeah, Colossians 3, children, obey your parents and everything. So this is not an excuse. You can't go home and say, mom, dad, uh, you know, deacon Christian said, Jesus said that I can hate you, or I don't have to listen to you, or I can detach myself from you. There's still firm scripture throughout all of it that talks about a husband to love your wife, a uh, wife to respect your husband, uh, children, obey your parents. So what is Jesus getting at right here? So the context of where we are in this scene right now is that Jesus is like a celebrity. We're in the Gospel of Luke. This whole year, we're in the Gospel of Luke. For all the Episcopalians out there, what year are we in? We're in year C. C. We'll get into that later. So uh, that's just church, church geeky stuff. Um, but we're in year C, which means we focus on Luke. And Luke is one, it's, it's the longest gospel. And Luke is the most verbose out of all the writers because Luke also wrote Acts. So this dude like wrote one third of the New Testament. And he has a lot to say about Jesus. He has a lot to say about Jesus' ministry. And he takes this, there's always a part where Jesus in every gospel is going from Galilee to Jerusalem. His walk to the cross. His, his going into the danger, going into the chaos, going into the final conclusion. He's leaving the comforts of Galilee and walking towards Jerusalem. And Luke's goes on for 10 chapters. So we hear more about all the healings. There's more healings that happen in Luke. Luke talks about Jesus more talking to the marginalized. He, he spends more time with women. He talks about being with the sick more. He talks about being with those who are lepers, with those who are poor. Luke creates a Jesus that is the man of the people, and the people love Jesus. He is a celebrity, and people are found saying, this guy is giving away food, this guy is healing me, he's healed my heart, he's healed my body, I heard he's even risen people from the dead. This is a time where people just want to come be with the celebrity Jesus. They want to consume what he is giving out. They want to consume what he is giving. But this is a part where the prophet Jesus has to come in and do that gut check. Oh, wait a minute. Everything's just, you're just not giving out everything out for free? What's going on here? This is where Jesus is going to give us a gut check and say, okay, I don't know, all, all you people are following me. But this is not some happy parade that we're leading that's going to go into Jerusalem. This Christian walk, I don't know if you're all ready for this. Because it's about to get real up in this Christian walk right now. Because where I'm going, it leads to my death. It leads to ridicule. It leads to punishment. It leads to people not accepting you. And if you do not have diehard faith in me, you will crumble and fall. Your kingdom will fall. Because we're going against the kingdom of earth. And we need to stand for what the kingdom of heaven is about. 
and we're not going to be accepted for that. So if you don't have me first, if you're not willing to leave everything and embrace me and have me be the one leading your life, you will crumble on this road to Jerusalem. The Holy Land waits us all. We've all been called to build the Holy Land of Jerusalem here, 2016. But if our faith is not capped, grounded, embodied by Jesus Christ, we will crumble. This world is way too chaotic. This life is way too chaotic. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And if our faith is not grounded in Jesus Christ, even Jesus says, if I am not first, this kingdom will crumble. And so he's not going to bring all these people on some march over to Jerusalem and have them crumble. He knows what's going to happen. John's gospel says before when he's released this kind of information, he says, because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. It's in John 6. Now, that context is Jesus when he says, in order to be a disciple, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that's where you saw some disciples being like, that's weird, I'm out here. <laughs> this dude is strange. But Jesus knows that people are showing up just to take. And that's fine. They're happy. They're getting fed. They're getting healed. But Jesus is trying to transform our hearts. And Jesus is trying to be the center of our lives. Because Jesus is believing in the kingdom of God, not just short-term band-aids. And he wants to go into the heart of it, into Jerusalem, and say, are you with me? Because if you're not 100% in, if you are not all in, you will crumble. He gives us an example where he says, you know, in that passage, he talks about building, building a, uh, like a, like a tower. And this idea, that's more of this agricultural reference that Jesus says, if you're going to build a tower and you're going to be looking out, you build this great tower to protect you because you are looking out for animals that are going to come in and eat your food or thieves are going to come in. You got to do your homework, right? Do I have the resources? Do I have the labor? Do I have the money to build this tower? If not, you're going to run out and everyone's going to laugh at you saying, ha ha, this guy didn't know what he was doing. If you're, going to go into the, if you're going to go into the heart of life, you're going to go into the struggles of life, but you don't have me, Jesus Christ, if I'm not at the center of your life, man, you are set up for chaos. Because once a true Christian, he's saying, a person of faith is not measured during a time of calm waters. We all know our faith is tested during a time of a tempest. It's during the tempest when we become married to Jesus, when we're saying, God, I can't do anything else right now. I am lost. I don't know what the doctors are going to do. I don't know what my spouse is doing. Lord, all I can do is trust in you. And these are the most chaotic moments, but these are the moments where Jesus comes in and just grips us because we completely surrender to God's presence and direction in our life. We just give over. We go all in. And sometimes it's during the most chaotic moments of our life is when our faith is deepened because we need Jesus so much because there is no other answer. This is one of those moments Jesus is saying, are you all in? We are called to be sacrificial people also, to give over our lives. Jesus says, bear your cross. You can't be a true disciple of mine unless you bear your cross. Like this, is, Jesus hadn't died yet. He wasn't on the cross yet. So for a... This would have been a, uh, a, a first century Jew in whatever this was, 33 AD. For a Jew to hear, you need to bear your cross. That's like saying, unless you go to the electric chair, you can't be with me. I mean, this is disturbing stuff. This is evocative stuff. This is provocative. Are you all in? Because Jesus is saying, do you trust me? Because I'm about to go over here, go on the worst form of death that this world, this Roman Empire knows, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to consume it, and I'm going to bury it in a grave, and then I'm going to rise. And I'm going to defeat death. I'm going to defeat the ugliness of this world. I'm going to defeat it. I'm going to bury it in the ground. Then I'm going to rise up and show you that there is eternal life. But are you with me? Do you believe that? Do you trust me? Do you trust me that that will happen? Even though if you're, on, if you're in your own middle of bearing your cross right now, bearing your cross is not like, oh yeah, I've got to take my grandma to church every day. I'm bearing my cross. It's not bearing your cross. That's just being a good grandson. <laughs> This is doing well. Bearing your cross is being able to give your life over sacrificially to this world, to our loved ones, but to God as well. I give you my life, Jesus. What are you going to do? We're putting Jesus in the driver's seat. There's often this, says, you know, I'm, Jesus is riding shotgun. Jesus is my co-pilot. It's cute. 
No, he's not. <laughs> Jesus is not riding shotgun. If Jesus is riding shotgun, we're not following Luke 14. Luke says, Jesus must be first. Jesus must be driving the car. If we're saying, yeah, Jesus is my co-pilot, well, yeah, I make some decisions and I bring Jesus along with me. Jesus plays with the music. He turns on the radio. You know, he, yeah, he can play DJ. But, I, you know, I, I turn the car. I decide where we go. No! When we do that, that's when we get lost. When we think we know where we're going, if we're not first starting with Jesus, Jesus is first. Be able to detach yourself away from every other decision, from your loved ones, from everything, and go just with Jesus. When we can do that, that's when we allow Jesus to be in the driver's seat. And we sit over and ride shotgun and say, all right, Lord, I will follow I mean, I do it all the time. I get my car, my, my figurative car here, and I drive, and I put Jesus in the passenger seat. Put him right in the passenger seat. Say, Lord, help me with this. I don't know why I made this decision, but can you help me with this, God? <laughs> Just come along with me. Help me help me with this, all right? What do you think? Is that cool, Jesus? Okay, no, no shh. Can you be quiet for a second? Okay, because I, I want to drive this, okay? I want to go where I want to go. But you can be here. You can be my crutch. It's cool, you know? Jesus is saying, no. Detach yourself from from, from your own ego, from your own pride, and put Jesus first, right? That's what he's asking us to do right here. Jesus knows all about human loyalties and how hard it is to say, I'm going to detach myself from you. You're my grandma. Can you just be my grandma right now? You're my grandma. I love you. But in order for me to be be the best grandson that I can be, who's got to be first? Jesus has got to be first in our relationship. That fuels me to be a better grandson to you. That fuels my heart. That makes me, gives me a selfless heart. That gives me want to pour my love out to you. Right? If I want to be the best spouse that I can be, I first start with Jesus. All right? This is going to be a hard one. This is going to be hard to, hard to say. But what Jesus is saying is be, you need to love Jesus more than your spouse. You need to love Jesus more than your children. You need to love Jesus more than your family. This sounds harsh to hear. It's like, what does that mean? Why, why, why? Because it makes you a better family member. It makes you a better father. It makes you a better spouse. It makes you a better child. It makes you a better friend to someone when Jesus is first. It's tough as a parent to look to your children and say, your wishes and desires are not first. But what Jesus' desires are first. It's tough to put that first, but... I remember, you know, in, in, in seminary, you take all these, like, you know, marriage therapy, uh, family systems classes, and someone was saying, you know, the, the, the key to a good marriage, and this is hard sometimes for couples to grasp, is that be, you need to love your spouse more than your children. It's like, maybe it's a little bit more, maybe it's a lot more, but that, because that marriage needs to be so tight and so good, because if this starts to break and crumble then the rest of the family can break and crumble. So no matter what, spouses, husband and wife need to take good care of themselves, love each other first, make sure this is good, home base is great, and then the children are provided for, right? So Jesus is saying the same thing. In order for that healthy marriage that has healthy marriage, which has wonderful children, you need to love me first. Jesus needs to be the top, the head of everything in our lives. And that fuels Makes us better co-workers, makes us better friends, makes us better uh, 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 parishioners here at church with one another. I have a family member who told me, she said, Christian, you know, the reason why my marriage didn't work out is when things got rough, I poured myself into the children and my husband poured himself into his work. Those are both legitimate things to do, to pour yourself into your work and to pour yourself into children. But she's like, where we missed one another is that we didn't pour ourselves into one another. We didn't work on our communication. So Jesus is taking that idea, and, you know, eventually they, you know, got divorced. But Jesus is taking that idea saying, you need to work with me first, or you and your spouse married to me, and then the children will be fed. And we say that in our own lives, even as single people, right? If Jesus is not my, was not leading me down this path, Man, I'm going to be freaked out. I'm a deacon of a church, and I've got to be responsible for all these people. I don't know what I'm doing. That's my anxiety. That's my fear talking. But is Jesus talking to me first? I don't know, because I just made him shotgun. Let's put Jesus in the driver's seat. And I know Jesus wants to build his church, so that take my hands off it. I let Jesus build everything. We also must bring Jesus into our temptations. Okay, so this easy thing about bringing Jesus into like, our love for one another, but what about when we are, get our challenges of life, when we are tempted 
Those times when we're on the internet and we want to go to a page we probably shouldn't go to. The times when you're in a fight with your spouse and maybe an old love hits you up on Facebook starts saying, hey, how you doing? I miss you. The time when you're so angry at someone and you just want to spout off with a friend, with a spouse, whatever. That's when we need to invite Jesus into our life right then and there. That's not when we run away, when we feel the urge, when we want to really separate ourselves from someone and say, Lord, Grandma Margie is driving me absolutely nuts. She took my college education fund and threw it away somewhere and spent it at the casinos. Lord, what am I going to do? I know you would never do that. (laughs) But I need to go to God first before I do anything. It's called like a spiritual pause. You have the spiritual pause where you invite Jesus into that temptation. And I get some breath, I get some peace. Say, Lord, I'm really angry with Margie right now. And before I go into emotions, before I go into fear, just be present in this moment. Be present in this moment. We need to invite Jesus into it so we don't, so he's always right there leading the way. In the club life, when I worked in the club life, I constantly had to invite Jesus into it. When my call to becoming into the priesthood grew, but I was still working in the nightclub in LA, there'd be moments where, yeah, there were a lot of temptations. There were a lot of things that were exciting for a 20-something guy in Los Angeles. But as my faith, you know, continued to grow, there were times where I'd say, Lord, I'm really tempted to make this choice right now. I'm really tempted to get in this car and drive over to someone's house. What do I do, God? And the Lord makes things happen. Invite him into it. Invite him into the temptation. Invite him into that darkness, right? I got into a, uh, as you all saw, that my, um, I don't know if you all met her, Anastasia was here last week. Um, it's my girlfriend. And great weekend. But we got into a little bit of a tiff at the end. And, you know, when you get into these arguments, you all know what I'm talking about. It's like your pride and your ego takes over and you just want to win. There's nothing about love between you two. It's all about, like, I, I just got to win. And there was a moment where, like, Jesus was not even in the car for me. Like, Jesus was like, I left him at the bus stop, like, four blocks away. And I was sitting there. I'm trying to prove my point, And I'm trying to get this because I'm right and you're wrong. You're not understanding me. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not. Like, it's embarrassing. I shouldn't even have, like, I hope I didn't have my collar on. But what I did was finally, <laughs> Father Todd's in the back there, probably going to get, like, suspended on Monday. But there's a... There, there was a point where I finally, at some point, by the grace of God, said, Jesus, just, just help me. Help me see this, because I'm lost here. I'm really lost. And it kind of like sinks you into your heart, and it made me like vulnerable. And for a second there, I can look at Anastasia, and I can see what was really hurting her. And I was like, oh, this is what's hurting you. This is why you're in pain. I might not agree with the reason that she thinks that made her pa- pa- like pained, hurt, but now I'm in my heart. Now I'm not in my head, I'm in my heart. Jesus came into the moment and put me in my heart. From that point forward, I was able to be, okay, to talk to me. Tell me what you're saying right here. And we worked our way towards the peace that God wants us to bring. Keeping Jesus shotgun, that never would have happened. Put Jesus in the front seat, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. That's where the kingdom can come into our lives. So where, is, where are your blockages right now? Where in your life... Is Jesus riding shotgun? Where is he even left at the bus stop? Is it in your marriage? Is it in your household? Is it it the way you handle money? Is it the way you handle work? Where is there a place where you'd be like, I can make a commitment to putting Jesus first. I'm I'm gonna put Jesus first. Do you have a conflict right now with someone in a deep argument? Here, it's St. Mary's, we know about that. We're a community of Christians. We get into conflict with one another. How do we let Jesus go into the room first before we get into a heated argument with someone? So Jesus is leading the way. Not our ego, not our pride. Because that's the only way we find peace. And then the mystery of the Holy Spirit brings the peace to us. This is how we go all in. This is the cost of discipleship that Luke is talking about. We go all in, we give all of our hearts, and we surrender ourselves and say, Lord, you go first, and then everything else will follow. And that's how we continue to build this church and build this community. But most importantly, build our relationship with Christ. Amen.